mentioned earlier the uh, the uprisings in the Arab world, and I wanted to ask you about the impact of those uprisings, both on uh, the theocracy in Iran and also on Israel's attempts to constantly encircle I Iran or, or portray it as the source of a danger to the rest of the world and to the region. Well, just to get away from Iran from a second, what you're having now is you're having a, you had it in, in Tunisia and you had Egypt spontaneous people's revolts, if you will. Uh, 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 your former colleague was in Tahrir Square uh, doing great stuff on it, and still in Cairo, I understand. True. And so, yes. um, you, you, had, you had something amazing. Yes, you had something amazing going on. And what you have now, and that of course spread, that spread um, uh, throughout the Gulf regions. And what you have now is a very, very, it's sort of unremarked upon by the press here in America. You have a counter-revolution going on, fueled largely by the Saudis uh, and their panic. Uh, you see the, uh, the implication of that in Bahrain, where the uh, unbelievable things are happening to the Shiites, the minority Shiites there. They may be majority in terms of population, but certainly minority in terms of power. And you have that regime uh, brutalizing its people in a way that's uh, beyond, I would argue, anything going on elsewhere, including in Syria. As bad as it is in Syria, it's much worse in Bahrain. And the United States, of course, for a lot of reasons, is ignoring that. You have the Gulf states in a, in a state of sort of controlled panic now. Uh, they're all sort of um, a locally owned uh, oil com you know, uh, uh, combines uh, owned by various uh, one-time Bedouin, uh, uh, you know, Bedouin uh, 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 desert livers, now suddenly run owners of huge, uh, huge complexes of oil, billionaires, all of them. And they, they want to stay in power in the Gulf, Oman, even Qatar. Uh, you can see a lot of problems with Al Jazeera's coverage, particularly of Bahrain. Um, Al Jazeera, for example, is always calling me, didn't call me for this story, because everybody wants to point fingers at Iran. Uh, the United States has essentially equated Iran's uh, upset uh, and encouragement of some of the, of the, of encouragement of the, of the stuff going on with Bahrain. Uh, as it's for the United States, this is as much of a sin as the uh, El Khalifi family uh, beating the hell out of everybody and doing worse than that. Um, uh, particularly doctors and nurses in uh, in Bahrain, uh, so there's there's a huge and it's the home uh, of the counter revolution US Navy going on. Fleet, si. uh, yes, yeah, absolutely, it is the home, and, and of course the Fifth Fleet often wisely will move a lot of their vehicles offshore when trouble gets going. Um, um, yes, it's the home of our. It's an, uh, Bahrain's an important base. Uh, it's an important facility, but uh, we could go other places too. I, I'm sure. It's just we have a lot of a lot of things there. Uh, but so you have a the American response to uh, you have this GCC the Gulf Cooperation uh, uh, Community or Committee. Uh, it's probably the only defense organization in the world that's the, the designed for all the countries getting together to ward against internal dissent, not external threat, but internal threats. And so we have this amazing institution. Morocco just joined <laughs> uh, the GCC. Uh, so. Uh, this is going on before our eyes, and we're not paying enough attention to it. Uh, and what we do is we focus on Iran as the bad guys. Iran's responsible. They're shifting uh, uh, gear to the, uh, the Syrians to help the Syrian Makabarat uh, control its, uh, its uh, society, as if the Ba'athist Party in Syria needs outside help in doing that. They're pretty good at it. Um, we have, we make, we've made Iran into a boogeyman. And I, my own guess is the reason we're so intent on, on, on the sanctions and keeping them going when there's no evidence of any weaponization. There's no real threat at all. Even the Israelis, I was in Israel last uh, in June, rather in April, two months ago now. And uh, I can't, they have crazy strain rules, uh, rules, ground rules on what you can report. But I can tell you right now, the, the Israelis understand, the more sophisticated ones and the serious uh, people in the intelligence community there, they understand that uh, Iran doesn't have a bomb now. Uh, if it decides to get one and they get a bomb, they're not going to throw it against Tel Aviv because they know that's, that's annihilation. They understand that, despite the fact they say different things and they raise the threat. So we're, we're, we're making the Iranians sort of the people responsible for what's going on in terms of uh, 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 the revolutions. And, and we're really on the wrong side of history on that, the United States. Uh, it's really the Saudis we should be looking at quite a bit. And when you get to that question, you then say, here are the Saudis who obviously we know from reports and from everything I've been told are very angry at us. They feel that our support for Mubarak undercut them. They, you know, they, they like to keep bridge control over a population that includes, uh, certainly in, in Saudi Arabia, many Shiites who work the oil fields. And so you have 
um, uh, the Saudis in, in full panic, refusing in anger at us, refusing to increase the oil uh, output. So the price of oil stays, uh, gasoline is four dollars or more a, a, a gallon. And here you have a president whose reelection is going to depend not on killing Osama bin Laden, hooray, he did it, but more on what the price of, of gasoline is going to be next year. And we have the Saudis stiffing us. And here you have Iran which is the second largest producer of natural gas in the world, also has a lot of oil. Its, it's fields are diminishing, but it's got a lot of stuff. The sanctions aren't working. Uh, the Iranians are selling stuff to, uh, uh, to India, to China, uh, Pakistan. They're doing a lot of business. Um, <laughs> you think, I mean, dumb and dumber, you think maybe we would start doing what a lot of people in the article I uh, I published uh, Tom Pickering, the former uh, secretary, uh, uh, under secretary of state, um, a longtime ambassador, very serious guy, uh, is among those who's been doing uh, involved in secret contacts with the Iranians and has been telling us for years, he and his group, get off this nuclear business. There's a lot of other issues you could deal with the Iranians. They want to be respected. You could really get some progress and maybe even getting to the point where we can, we don't have to, uh, we're not interested in changing uh, the, the regime there. That's impossible. We do know that, unlike Bush and Cheney, Obama doesn't want to. Maybe we can get to the point where you can start getting some of the energy that they have to produce. Instead, we're trying to keep them from the market. It just doesn't make sense. And sanctions, you know, go ask Castro how well they work. We've been sanctioning Cuba, uh, what, uh, since 1960, 61, 62. And, you know, uh, um, and as far as I know, Cuba's still there, and, and so is Castro. Cy Hirsch, very quickly, we haven't spoken to you in a while. Well, and I, sorry, your, my earphone popped out. Hold on a second. Okay. We're talking Say to again. the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Seymour Hirsch. Cy, we haven't talked to you in a while. Your assessment of President Obama's war in Afghanistan and Pakistan. <laughs> Uh, disaster, stupid. I do think that the, the White House really wanted the the, um, uh, the Bin Laden raid, about which I've been doing a lot of work. Um, there's always things are always more interesting than they seem. Uh, um, I'm not suggesting he wasn't killed or anything like that, but just more interesting. And um, uh, uh, I think the getting of Bin Laden will give Obama the freedom to make a serious cut in this war in Afghanistan that everybody in the inside, everybody on the inside, believe me, I don't know about Petraeus, General Petraeus, who for some reason is going to the CIA, um, um, uh, just as for some reason Panetta, who doesn't really know much about the Pentagon, is going to the Pentagon. I don't quite understand what they're doing, but um, uh, this is a, a, a war that has nothing to do with American national security. And the obvious way out is to actually find a way to start talking to Mullah Omar. Instead, we keep on isolating him, and we're driving Pakistan crazy with this war. Uh, we're, we're, we're increasing uh, the jihadism there. We're increasing the terrorism there. Uh, we're sticking it to the uh, PACs in very direct ways. It's a totally counterproductive system. Uh, we have our guys going out doing night raids. We always call them NATO, and the press goes along with calling them NATO. But our Joint Special Operations Command is still going out. I don't fault the guys doing it. Let me make it clear. They're very, very competent guys. They're under orders, and they do what they do. They just do it very well. But there's no way you're going to make strikes at night and not kill an awful lot of, uh, of non-combatants, collateral damage, they call it. And uh, it's just uh, we're hated. We're outsiders. Uh, we don't have to be doing the bombs to be hated by the Pashtun. That's been the society all along. The Pakistanis are in terrible fear of what's going to happen in Afghanistan. They always see Afghanistan as a bulwark against India. They're afraid of our relationship with India. And I'll tell you, the biggest problem he has, as awful as those things are, as counterproductive and as much as he's following, oh, yes, Bush and Cheney in those policies. And I think the president, I'll, I'll be writing about this, I think he was really sandbagged by the Pentagon in, in, after he got into office when he was new and innocent. And I still think, I think right now, I'd almost use the word cult to describe what's going on in the White House. He's, he's, everything's political. He's isolated. Uh, uh, very good people say they've never seen a president uh, this isolated in terms of being unable to get to him with different opinions, et cetera. So he's really captive of a few, of a few people there. I know this, doesn't, this sounds, may, may sound strange, but I know what I'm talking about. You can't get to the guy. 
And um, uh, even, for example, uh, Pickering, as competent as he is, he is, and Pickering's done some wonderful stuff for the United States intelligence community undercover. And so he's known as a trusted guy. Those guys who've been involved in talking to Iran uh, off the record, track two policy talks for years, can't get to the president. Uh, he may not even know they're looking for him. I, I just don't know. And so here we have this very bright guy continuing insane policies that are counterproductive, do nothing for the United States. And meanwhile, the real crisis is going to be about Iraq, because whatever you're hearing, Iraq is going bad. Sunnis are killing Shia. It's sectarian war. And the big question is going to be whether we pull out or not. And there's going to be a lot of pressure to keep them. We've got 40 or 50,000 Americans there to keep them there. Um, uh, I don't know how it's going to play out, but I'll tell you right now, there are, there are Sunni uh, Baathist groups in Damascus, in various places, in the United Kingdom, Leeds is one place, ready as soon as we get out to declare an alternative government, a provisional government, and announce that they're going to uh, retake um, uh, I Iran from the Shiites and from uh, Iraq from the Shiites, who they believe are totally tied into the Iranians, which probably isn't true, but there's always been the fiction we have or the fear we have. Iran controls Iraq. There's a mutuality of interest, but Maliki is a very tough customer. You know, Maliki worked for 21 years uh, in Syria as a cop for the Macabre, for the secret police. He was working as a sergeant there for 21 years in Syria before he went back in as an exile after, the, after we kicked out uh, Saddam. He is nobody's patsy. Uh, but there's going to be a ho holy hell there. It's going to be probably the biggest problem the president has next year, uh, along with gas, along with the, the crazy Republicans that are running against them. Um, he's going to, and along with Afghan, along with Iran, it's going to be Iraq. We're going to be back looking at Iraq as that country goes berserk. Uh, Hirsch, I'm I wanna, very cheerful. I'm really uh, Mr. Happy News. Huh? I want to get back to uh, the, the uh, Arab Spring for a, a moment uh, and ask you, the, uh, do you think that uh, in Egypt, for example, the uprisings led to the overthrow of Mubarak and now to the trial, apparently, the trial of Mubarak? Uh, it is understandable why the Egyptian people would want to put this ruthless leader on trial. But do you think that this the trying of Mubarak uh, has had repercussions throughout the rest of the region with all these other dictators who say, well, I better fight to the end, uh, because if not, I will end up like uh, Mubarak immediately put on trial by my people. Well, you know, I, I can't say that about the trial, because I haven't actually talked to anybody about the, whether the trial makes a difference. But before that, I would say what you're saying is absolutely right. The moment the United States, the waffling that the president did, if you remember, he was with the kids, he was against the kids, and we had the secretary of the state saying the same thing, with, against. Um, uh, um, uh, there's no question that the fear of, there's an enormous fear in, in the Arab world, in the Gulf, in the Gulf region. Uh, and right now, they're very angry at us. Uh, they're terrified of Iran. Uh, and and uh, they're very worried about internal security. They're worried about uh, what's going on in Baran uh, is, I'm telling you, it's a sensationally underreported story. The brutality there is be beyond, it's, it, it's shocking. And again, the Saudis are directly involved, sort of with our OK. Uh, again, uh, if you don't think uh, that Saudi Arabia has enormous control of Asala, in, in, in Yemen, you're not paying attention. He's got enormous control over him. They, the Saudis, if the Saudis wanted to, they could play a very positive role there. They're not. They're, they're, the, the, he's their guy. And so you have this counter-revolution fed by the Saudi billions. And the Saudis went recently in the uh, uh, Prince Bandar, my favorite dark prince, was recently in um, Pakistan. And the, the Pakistanis are supplying some thuggery, some arms, some muscle in Bahrain. And I think the Pakistanis are also helping out in internal security inside, the Saudi, inside Saudi Arabia itself. And so you, you, everybody's muscling up now to beat up the kids who want to do something. And meanwhile, if you look at it, the single biggest blow against Al Qaeda, uh, I would argue bin Laden, of course, was great, uh, wonderful. I'm glad he's gone and all that stuff. But the other big blow was the, was the Arab Spring, because once you lose the sense of humiliation in the, among the Arab population and the sense of fear, you're seeing that in Syria right now. Uh, although that's also complicated because the Saudis are deeply involved in trying to get rid of or certainly make it more difficult for Bandar, uh, for Bashar Assad to exist. Uh, there, that's a more complicated position. Uh, but uh, once the fear is gone, Al-Qaeda is gone. So the one thing we had going for ourselves in terms of uh, getting rid of this, this, uh, this, these terrorists who prey on the frustrations of the Arab, uh, of the Arab young, uh, wow, instead we're going the wrong way. 
And it's, it's a horrible mistake. It's happening right in front of us. It's not being seen, but it's right there to be seen.